High School for a Little East Conference matchup between the UMass Dartmouth Corsairs and your UMass Boston Beacons. The Corsairs come in at 3-3-1, and 1-0-1 and in conference, while the Beacons come in at 3-6-1 and 2-0 and and in Little East Conference play. Ladies and gentlemen, before today's starting lineups, we'd like to recognize honorary captain Caitlin Morse. Morse is a junior women's softball player at UMass Boston who helped raise over $39,500 to help UMass Boston Hall of Famer Catherine Wall and her family deal with medical bills, travel, and expenses. Morse will be taking part in today's coin flip with the captains from UMass Boston and UMass Dartmouth. Hello and welcome to James Cotter Field for today's matchup between the UMass Boston Beacons and the UMass Dartmouth Corsairs. I'm John Scudris and the Beacons Broadcasting Network is proud to present the second annual We Do It For The Wall game. This momentous moment celebrates the impact of Catherine Wall, a 2013 inductee into the UMass Boston Hall of Fame. A four-year Beacons soccer, hockey, and softball player and six-time all-conference team nominee, Catherine lost her third bout with breast cancer in September, and she will be greatly missed. But her memory and impact goes on in the hearts and soul of every single athlete here on Beaconville. Her strength and determination is sure to warm the hearts of those in attendance, and we hope that the Beacons play on the field does as well, as this blistery cold New England autumn welcomes the Corsairs to Beaconville. The Beacons have struggled offensively all season, but their doldrums have dwindled in conference play at just 3-6-1 overall. The Beacons may have one of the worst overall records in the conference, but a 2-0 LEC record puts them near the top of the standings. Jacqueline O'Grady's four goals lead the way as she and the Beacons welcome back supporting stars Kara Peters and Carly Robinson this afternoon. All the news isn't positive, however, as backer Elisa Brooks will miss this weekend's action. We'll see how that will affect a banged-up Alyssa Fugil as she and the Beacons look to open up conference play at 3-0. For their opponents from Dartmouth, this season has been a pleasant surprise. A 1-1 one one draw with the conference's preseason favorites from Western Connecticut State precipitated back-to-back -back wins against LaSalle and Rhode Island College. They'll look to stay undefeated in the LEC as this one gets underway right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Now we take a look at the pregame statistics for each of these two squads coming into the third conference game of the year for the Beacons. On the year, UMass Boston 3-6-1 and one overall. Offensively, you see, have struggled tremendously. Less than one goal a game for the UMass Boston Beacons. Dartmouth not much better, just over a goal a game. But so far, they have fared much better out of conference than the Beacons have. It'll be a defensive battle, and at least that's what we expect on the horizon. But before we get into more on this game, let's take a look at the player to honor. And that is, of course, Catherine Wall. One of the greats of all time here on Beaconville. Her impact spread well beyond the pitch or the ice rink as the 2013 inductee into the UMass Boston Hall of Fame was a three-time all-conference soccer and softball player, also a member of the women's hockey team back in the day, and an assistant coach on the 2012 LEC championship team. She will be greatly missed, but her impact continues on as we keep going here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Let's take a look at the player to watch for the UMass Boston Beacons. As that is not correct. There is no Pedro da Silva on UMass Boston. We'll move forward to around Beaconville as we get our kinks unraveled on the pregame show. Taking a look around Beaconville, the volleyball team losing in the fourth set 2-1 to one to Babson as that one continues from Babson College. The men's soccer team right now in a nil-nil draw against UMass Dartmouth, although they are out shooting UMass Dartmouth by wide margin moments ago. It was listed as 13-2. to two. And the cross-country men's and women's tennis matches were all postponed today due to inclement weather. And as if you can see on your screen, it is not going to get much better the rest of the afternoon. As for women's soccer, we take a look around the LEC scoreboard and what we see is not a whole lot on that LEC scoreboard as there's no score in any of the matches early on between any of the teams in Little East play. We'll hope the Beacons can stem the tide there and get something going as they continue forward here in 2015. So here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network, of course, you saw in front of you and I mentioned how critical this afternoon is for 
not only the Beacons, but Catherine Wall's family as the Hall of Famer, the UMass Boston Beacons Hall of Famer, passed away from breast cancer in September. And it's a momentous achievement, not just for the those who she am impacted, but also those who continue to be impacted by athletics here in New England as well as across the globe. One of those athletes is Caitlin Morse, and what an impact she has had not only on the student body here, but also on Catherine Wall and her family. Morse is a junior women's softball player here at UMass Boston who helped raise nearly $40,000 to help Catherine Wall and her family deal with medical bills, travel, and expenses. Morse will be taking part in today's coin flip, and if you see her on your screen, she is in the middle there in pink, and she has had a profound impact on everybody here on Beaconville as we now celebrate a moment of silence for the passing of Catherine Wall. We already celebrated Catherine Wall and will continue to do so, but right now we celebrate and honor America as the playing of the National Anthem here from BC High. We're just about set for women's soccer action here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Glad to have you with us. I am John Scudras. As the two teams head to their respective benches for a final huddle up with their coaching staffs, we're going to take a look at the Beacons starting lineup. For UMass Boston starting, it'll be number two, Kara Peters, a senior from Agawam. She'll be joined by sophomore Kerry Alexander, number four from Carver. Number seven, Jacqueline O'Grady is the team's leading goal scorer. The summer's Connecticut native is a freshman, but she's been playing well beyond her years with four goals in nine games. Julia Massionis is starting as well, a freshman from Milford. She's joined out there by fellow freshman Kate Levitt, a Plymouth native, and sophomore Cassie Levesque from Methuen. Number 16, Alexandria Levesque, the sister of Cassie, is joining her Kin on the pitch as it'll be the senior from Methuen, number 16. They're rounding out the starting lineup with Natasha Seabor, Nicole McMiniman, and Sam Bendick, a trio of seniors who will play out in front of Alyssa Fugel, a spectacular freshman netminder from East Hampton, Massachusetts. Meanwhile, the Corsairs of UMass Dartmouth, they come in at 3-3-1 overall, fresh off a loss at the hands of Bridgewater State last week. They have Madison Boucher, a Southampton, Massachusetts native and sophomore goalkeeper in net. She's joined on the pitch by number two, Kayla Lycano, number five, Kaylee Birch, number eight, Courtney Hewitt, number nine, Nicole Starkey-Cox, Erica Farias, a midfielder from Tiverton, Rhode Island, number 10. Number 12 in team's leading goal scorer and point getter, Talia D'Ambrosio, she is a Warwick, Rhode Island native. Number 14, Liz Stearns. Number 15, Erica Hammond. And number 16, Sarah Pacheco are the backers. And the final midfielder, the sophomore from Fall River, number 19, Abby Silva. So Boucher, double zero in orange, heads to her net on the left side of your screen as the Corsairs come out in their typical road garb. Uh, similar as some of the staff up here was mentioning to rugby uniforms. And sometimes not so easy on the eyes, needless to say for a broadcaster as well. Although the numbers do pop a bit. The Beacons in their typical home garb as they have the white and blue kit. The white and blue shorts as well and pink socks to celebrate 
Catherine Wall and really all breast cancer survivors and victims as this terrible disease continues to wreak havoc on our globe. But we hope one day a cure will be found. And obviously, a very, very special day for Catherine Wall's family as they, we celebrate her impact on Beaconville and beyond. The opening tip is... Here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network and getting control of this one will be D'Ambrusio once they get underway. The referees are set to go. They're in red today as D'Ambrusio drops this one back and the Corsairs will look to get their second conference victory of the season. They've been strong in the LEC so far. I mentioned the 1-1 draw a couple of weeks ago with WestCon. That's momentous because Western Connecticut State was the preseason predicted leader in this conference with 56 preseason votes and four first place votes as the Beacons look to stem the tide of the Corsairs rush here early on. UMass Boston sees the Corsairs move forward. This one well defended by Sam Bendick. She tries to siphon it forward before it's knocked out of bounds by Co Courtney Hewitt. Bendick with the throw in from the near side right in front of the Corsairs bench and she uses every ounce of that strength to get it well above the defense and eventually kicked out of bounds yet again by Erica Hammond and a throw in for Nicole McMiniman. Nicole looking for assistance in the form of number seven Jacqueline O'Grady, the team's leading goal scorer. Down there as well as Kara Peters back from injury this afternoon along with Carly Robinson. Unfortunately for UMass Boston, last touch by McMiniman and out of bounds. So far the Beacons putting the pressure into the opposing zone, but here come the Corsairs the other way with a, perhaps an opportunity. Good defense by Peters. And this one comes out of bounds on the far end. Last touch by UMass Dartmouth. Offensively for the Beacons, obviously losing Crystal Layden to graduation last year was a difficult defeat for Amy Zombeck's club, and it certainly has shown up on the scoreboard. Offensively, they're led by freshman Jacqueline O'Grady's four goals, but it's been really a struggle to get anything offensively short of one game against Rhode Island College when the Beacons were shut out for the first 45 minutes before scoring a trio of unanswered in the second half to win 3 nothing. Other than that, though, the Beacons have really not done much offensively all season long despite their success in the conference. We'll see if the Corsairs can take advantage of that as a spinorama kick there by number 12, Talia D'Ambrusio is wide of the net and a goal kick will ensue for Alyssa Fugel. Fugel's been a pleasant surprise this year. The freshman netminder has been spectacular. This season, she's allowed 14 goals on 84 shots, a save percentage of 833. A 3-5 and five record with one draw as well as this boot from the right leg of the Beacons freshman netminder is taken out there by number 21, Natasha Stebor. She looks for some assistance and unable to get to carry Alexander before it's booted out of bounds. Alexander's throw is over the head of her intended target, now knocked down, and the Beacons move forward. Sloppy play here on a sloppy weather afternoon. Luckily, we've been able to avoid any precipitation, but with the way the clouds come creeping through... That might uh, be an ominous statement by myself as a foul on the UMass Boston Beacons. A free kick coming up and taken by the Corsairs as UMass Dartmouth moves forward. Booted into the box on a smart play there by Erica Farias. But no one home as Fugel is able to corral. A weak punt. I'm sure the wind didn't help. This weather will cause a lot of the shots and deep lob passes to die in the thick air as it's kibooted near side by Farius. Unfortunately for the Corsairs, no one home. McMiniman lets it go out of bounds for a Sam Bendick throw. You're just joining us. This is the second annual We Do It For The Wall game as the Beacons see this one come out of bounds. It'll be a throw for the Corsairs. Catherine Wall... One of the best athletes, men or women, here that Beaconville has ever seen. And you can evidence that by just her versatility. Three sports, a all-conference nominee in two of them, as this one comes out of bounds off McMiniman's noggin as a throw-in comes in here from Courtney Hewitt. And a long boot off the left leg of Talia D'Ambrusio is to the far side of the box, knocked down with the head of the Beacons defense and using their head wisely as they get it out of immediate harm's way. But a great play by the midfield to keep it in before Bendick has to boot this one to the near side and out of bounds. Coming over to take this throw will be Sarah Pacheco as she wears 16. 
Tossed in off the chest of number 19, Abby Silva. Silva unable to get control of the ball after that play. It did come off of her arm, but she was out of bounds and a throw in for McMiniman. Slow moving game as O'Grady tries to pierce three defenders, unsuccessful. Tried to do it all herself there and could not. As now moving left to right and getting it around the D was Silva. Unable to get help there was Abby as this one siphoned forward for an opportunity for UMass Boston moving forward, but unable to get control. Here is O'Grady looking for help. She has Julia Massionis down there, but she was outnumbered three on one, and that's usually the way that goes when you try to go at it without the numbers. The Beacons last time out here at home saw a lot of offsides calls go against them, as meanwhile onsides is... The Corsairs of Dartmouth, but a good defensive play by UMass Boston to keep it out of harm's way. And booted all the way down the field on a wise move by Stebor. This one comes out of bounds on the near side off the leg of the Corsairs, so UMass Boston gets a throw. I think it'll be McMiniman to make it. For Nicole, number 22 in blue, a senior from Ackworth, Georgia. Off the noggin of Stebor, coming towards Massionis as Julia tries to go around the defense. But a good defensive play there, and then booting it out of bounds. She didn't really have to do that. She had plenty of space, but without an eyes in the back of her head, unable to realize it. Now UMass Boston's going to get a corner kick from the right boot of Kate Levitt. The freshman from Plymouth, standing at five foot seven inches, will look to stand tall with this corner kick. The Beacons getting... A chance for the first scoring opportunity of the afternoon. Just two defenders not in the box for UMass Boston as Levitt is ready. Here's the boot with the right leg. Didn't get much of it, but it was in perfect placement, and UMass Boston scores! The UMass Boston Beacons get out on top first as Kate Levitt able to penetrate the defense with a soft pass from the corner, and UMass Boston gets the first goal of this afternoon's affair. They'll credit Nicole McMiniman with the goal. I was just singing her praises on the near side on defense. But the Ackworth, Georgia native with the goal for Nicole on the season. That is going to be goal number one. So good for her as in her 11th game here in 2015, the Georgia native is able to notch her first goal on the season. So the Beacons get out in front early, which is something they haven't done much at all this season. We'll see if the Corsairs have it in them to come back. This one out of bounds. It was initially booted by Lecano, but they'll say, and yeah, they will say Lecano was out of bounds when she tried to deflect it off of O'Grady. So McMiniman, the goal scorer, tosses it into Jacqueline. Lucky number seven, able to momently, momentarily find Seabor, but she sees this one taken off of her, her foot, and moving forward now with control is number eight, Nicole Starkey-Cox. Booted down there, smart play by Hewitt. Unfortunately for the Corsairs, Beacons continuing to up the pressure. Stebor is unable to get control. Now motoring forward, looking for assistance there was number 12, Talia D'Ambrusio, but her feed intended for Hewitt was unsuccessful. Lecano's out there on defense, along with Hammond and Stearns as the Corsairs move to the near side and unable to keep that one in was Erica Farias, a midfielder from Tiverton, as this one comes for Beacon's throw as McMiniman will defer to Sam Bendick. There's 37 minutes left here in the first half, so obviously very early in this 90-minute affair. The Beacons lead one to nothing on the first goal of the season for number 22, Nicole McMiniman. This long lob pass is going to only find Alyssa Fugil as the Beacons netminder is able to corral and boot it forward. She's not been tested yet as this one comes off the head of Stebor. And to the near side where number 16, Sarah Pacheco, will let it go out of bounds. Throw in from Sarah, knocked down with the foot of Hewitt. Hewitt able to get it back to Pacheco. Back and forth they go as Courtney looking for help from number 12, Talia D'Ambrusio, but her spinorama pass is off the mark, intercepted there momentarily by Peters, and that Kara will D up on Farias as this one comes out of bounds. Unable to get control was Hewitt, and a throw in for Sam Bendick. Her throw comes right to the foot of Pacheco, who looks for help and unable to keep her footing there was D'Ambrusio. She looks for a call, and I don't think she'll get it as it comes out of bounds for a 
Dartmouth Corsair's throw-in. Knocked down here for Farias to move forward. D'Ambrusio settles it down. Deed up there well by Levitt. And now back to number eight, Courtney Hewitt it comes. He tries to siphon it through, and they'll say on sides, but good defensive play by McMiniman to at least send this one out of bounds and allow the Beacons defense to regroup. Hewitt throws this one in. Moving forward now is Pacheco and Farias with control. Farias deed up by Levitt, comes back towards the top of the box. And this one's booted through and unable to get it to anybody there was Silva is knocking it down was Levitt. Levitt will try a stretch pass for O'Grady. Jacqueline's got wheels to burn, and she'll beat the defense. If she can keep it in bounds, she can't. Just not enough to get there in time before the ball trickled out of bounds from the long stretch pass from Kate Levitt. And you might want to go out of bounds before you throw that in as she tried to toss it in from inside the pitch. That's Sarah Pacheco. It's confusing because it's a football field as well. Typically used for BC high football games. Meanwhile, here is Natasha Stebor. Tried to find Kara Peters, but a fine defensive play by Dartmouth. Play made there by Starkey Cox as she gets some help from D'Ambrusio and now moving forward, but outnumbered are the Corsairs. With control is Abby Silva. Silva for Talia D'Ambrusio. Lets it go. Is streaking towards this one is Farius. Farius gets around the D. Good move by Erica, and she tries to send a bad angle shot to the far side of the post, but unable to get that one in the crosshairs was Erica Farias and out of bounds off of UMass Dartmouth for a Beacon School kick. 34 minutes to go in the first half. Couple of shots apiece with the Beacons leading 1-0. Nicole McMiniman just seven minutes into the game getting the first goal. Fugel able to pound this one forward. No one home for the Beacons initially. And three consecutive headers almost found it to D'Ambrusio, but the Beacons defense playing stalwart here early. Kara Peters trying to get control over on the far side. She couldn't. Alexander also down there, but it comes out of bounds, and it looks like it's off of the Corsairs for another goal kick. Last time out for UMass Boston, they were on the road, which will be a trend this season as the Beacons can play just three games here on Beaconville. This is their second after a 3-0 triumph two weeks ago against Rhode Island College. Western Connecticut State joins us in two weeks right here from James Cotter Field. That's October the 17th. If you can't come on out to the game, be sure to check it out on the Beacons Broadcasting Network because this one's gobbled up by Fugil in the box, and she'll move slowly to get some assistance. I said last time out and then didn't finish my thought. That was a couple of nights ago, a 6-1 to defeat at the hands of Endicott College, a very difficult foe for UMass Boston, a team with a lot of speed. The Beacons right now are one of the youngest teams in the conference, and despite that youth and inexperience, they're 2-0 and in LEC play with a leg up to make it 3-0, and already leading one to nothing. Far side of the field, Beacons trying to move forward, looking for Masionis, but unable to get it to her was Alexander as it's booted out of harm's way by the Corsair's defense. Fighting for possession and sending it forward for O'Grady. She lets it go. McMiniman unable to outmuscle her opponent. That's not her strength. It's speed is what she is an expert at as this one is booted out of harm's way. And D'Ambrusio utilizing her long legs to get around the D, but an even better play by Levitt to boot this one to the bench of the Corsairs, resulting in a throw. The ensuing throw will be Courtney Hewitt's as she will find number nine, Nicole Starkey Cox. Cox getting around the defense and sending it forward. It was deflected by Bendick, and that aided the visitors as Silva loses control and then tripping over the ball and getting tumbled down like a tree in the forest before getting hacked from behind was number 16, Alex Levesque. Eventually it does come out of bounds off of the foot of McMiniman and a throw in coming here for Courtney Hewitt. D'Ambrusio with control from the outside of the box, tries to send it in with a sweeping left leg, but it's knocked down by Stebor. And UMass Boston playing just well enough to keep it out of harm's way, out of the box, and out of a goal-scoring opportunity. But the Corsairs are doing a good job with possession since the Beacon's goal. They've maintained the time of possession since McMiniman's first of the season, as losing control of this one was Cassie Levesque. Near side opportunity, moving forward with this is Pacheco. Sarah trying to get around the defense, but Natasha Stebor says au contraire as she gets control and moves it near side for Nicole McMiniman. 
No accuracy on that feed for O'Grady as this one comes out of bounds. We're just about away a, f a fourth of the way through this first half of play as this one is knocked down. Meanwhile, here is Hewitt able to send it forward, looking for assistance in the form of Abby Silva, but McMiniman is home to defend. Since that goal, it's been mostly in the Beacon's own zone. Kara Peters unable to get control, nor was Natasha Stebor as it comes to the near side and out of bounds off of the Corsairs for a Bendik throw. Out of bounds off O'Grady. For UMass Dartmouth, they've only played the seven games overall, obviously three fewer than UMass Boston. They've struggled, however, away from Dartmouth as they are 0-3 on the road this season. Trying to stem the tide there and get their first road victory. It'll be critical for them to do so, as much like UMass Boston, not many home games left, as the Corsairs are coming off a four-game homestand, dating from the 19th of September through the 30th. In those games, they were 2-1-1, one, and one, as this one is a shot attempt from outside the box. That came off the foot of Pacheco, where Fugil had to dive to her right. Wasn't a big threat, but Alyssa, nevertheless, had to come out. It looked like she touched it, and I think the coaching staff for the Corsairs are saying the same thing. Alyssa Fugil definitely touched that ball, but what should be a corner kick will result in a Beacons favoring goal kick. We'll take it here in the Beacons Broadcasting Network. After this game, it'll be a Monday home matchup against Fitchburg for the Corsairs, as this goal kick is intercepted by the Corsairs as they look to get things going. It's all been in the Beacon's end since their goal as Pacheco tries to find D'Ambrusio but defended smartly there and able to get it out of harm's way. O'Grady chasing after it with Pacheco and Jacqueline sees this one come out of bounds. It'll be off of Jacqueline O'Grady. She doesn't think so and she'll get shoved from behind as tempers start to heat up in what is a icy cold day here in early October in Boston, Massachusetts. Kara Peters unable to get it around the defense. However, Kate Levitt is, as it, knocking this one down is Masionis. Out in front of the D, but easily offsides was O'Grady, as she'll get whistled from the judge on the far side, and it'll result in a free kick with 28 and a half minutes to go in half number one. Haven't seen any Beacon substitutions yet. Obviously, in a 90-minute game, you're going to see some of them. We'll get those to you once it does occur, as Bendick takes this free kick and just decides to hammer it out of bounds. On the near side, a throw in here for Hewitt as she looks for the assistance of Silva, knocked off the noggin of Bendick and getting a little help to almost clear this one out. Unfortunately, unable to, but D'Ambrusio got very little on a shot that she took from midair, and it's gobbled up by Fugil, and number 30 will throw this one towards the far side, but unable to knock it down and move forward with it was Alexander. Kara Peters jockeying for possession. She loses control. Chance for the Corsairs. Great feet in front and a great aggressive play by Alyssa Fugil as she came out of her net to gobble that one up legally. And she prevented a golden scoring opportunity for the visiting Dartmouth Corsairs. So here's Kate Levitt taking this one off the side of her left foot. Unable to get it to O'Grady, but Jacqueline aggressively pursuing on defense. Here's Courtney Hewitt to the near side. She finds... Starkey Cox, who tries to split the defense and find D'Ambrusio. Instead, it comes even farther for Pacheco to try to center, but this one off the side of her foot from a bad angle, and Fugil will have another goal kick. Talia D'Ambrusio, a Warwick, Rhode Island native, number 12 out there in the striped white and blue kits. She leads the Dartmouth Corsairs in points so far, tied with Abby Silva with eight. Both also have three goals as this goal kick is taken by the Corsairs. They continue to maintain the time of possession advantage. And with it, will look to get their first goal of the afternoon, trailing one to nothing as Starkey Cox has control. Good right to left stop move to get around Peters and an even better defensive play using her head out there by Natasha Stebor to keep it away from... Number 10, Erica Farias. She finds D'Ambrusio, who's got speed and great maneuvers, but an even better defensive play by Bendick to keep it out of the box and send it back towards Silva, who will just send this one in towards the net to be gobbled up by Fugil. Right 
So Fugil will try to send this one forward, and just as it was earlier on, it hits that Gulf Stream in the air and just dies right around the 40-yard line of this football field. So UMass Boston leads one to nothing. Erica Hammond to the near side for Pacheco as Sarah will find an offensive teammate off of the toe there of Abby Silva, trying to get it to the far side, unable to do so. And Kara Peters, fresh back from injury, stretch pass for O'Grady. Jacqueline uses some of her strength to shove the defender to the ground. That was Erica Hammond, and it did come out of bounds off of number 15, Erica Hammond. So now the Beacon see Natasha Stebor get the throw from McMiniman. Far side feed from Stebor as she's looking for Alexander. Kerry turns it over immediately and aggressively having to get back on D was Alex Levesque, and she did. Alex able to spread this one up the field. Unfortunately for the Beacons, the Corsairs' defense has been stout to prevent it from getting behind them. That one is a dangerous play, but no call as a good play made by Levesque. And now coming all the way back to the other side of the field for the Corsairs to clean up right on the lip of the box in front of the netminder, Madison Boucher. Haven't really mentioned Madison Boucher since the game started. She hasn't had to make a save. The only shot the Beacons have had, or rather I should say the only shot on goal, has gone in the goal for Nicole McMiniman's first of the season as this one is whistled out of bounds. So we will have our first substitutions of the afternoon. Entering the game for the visiting Corsairs, number 23 from Saugus, Massachusetts, the sophomore midfielder Maggie McCormick. Meanwhile, Carly Robinson will enter for UMass Boston as the Pittsfield, Massachusetts native is a freshman, and she will join the pitch, number 13 in white and blue, out there on the pitch for Amy Zombeck. Knocking this one down and trying to find some help as the Beacons will be corralled and lose control. That was Alex Levesque, but unfortunately for the Corsairs, McMiniman's speed will be down there on D, but it comes out of bounds nonetheless for a throw-in for Bendick. Sam with control as she sends it forward for O'Grady, defended there by Number 16, Sarah Pacheco, but O'Grady gets a little help momentarily from Levitt and Stebor as this one instead comes the other way. The Corsairs offensively haven't gotten many scoring chances, but the time of possession advantage and the time on attack is no doubt in their favor. Near side and in her own end with control momentarily was Hammond. Her feed is off the leg of O'Grady, and it results in a Pacheco throw. 23 minutes to go here in half number one. D'Ambrusio will try to find some help on the far end away from the stream of Beacons defenders. But she's unable to do so. As it's defended smartly by UMass Boston and able to move it forward was Julia Masionis. It's out of bounds now and a throw in for Sarah Pacheco. Knocked down by Julia but unable to get control as this one comes off of the deflection from Masionis and out of bounds. Deja vu all over again as Pacheco lines up again for a throw. Abby Silva took a seat for the Corsairs when Maggie McCormick came in moments ago. McCormick's the one running in front of D'Ambrusio and not getting the feed there. It came behind her. She chases and unable to get there as the Beacons will see Bendick yet again throw one in. Sam is unable to find a Beacon. She finds D'Ambrusio who tries to get it towards number 12 but unfortunately for the Beacons, unable to get there as it's intercepted and then tripped up, and that'll be a whistle as the call will come on Erica Farias. It wasn't D'Ambrusio moments ago. It was Erica Farias. Very similar in their builds as number 10 is called for the whistle. No cards or any extracurricular activities after the whistle as the Beacons will see an opportunity for Robinson, freshly entered into the game to boot it forward. And the freshman will look for some help in the form of Masionis, who chases this one and can't keep it in. So the free kick goes for naught as Pacheco's throw from well in her own zone will come towards the assistance of number 15, Erica Hammond. Hammond tries to head this one forward. It comes back towards her, and now she boots it over her head towards Hewitt, and Courtney sees this one come out of bounds. Into the Beacons bench off of Dan Campania. And meanwhile, UMass Boston continues to struggle to get anything going offensively since they scored that first goal. However, it is nice to have an early lead, something the Beacons haven't had this season very much. 
Robinson able to keep it in the attacking zone. Peters knocks it down on an attempt for a clear, and then she's sandwiched between two Corsairs. Oh, my goodness. The diminutive Kara Peters able to bounce back up, and that's a good thing considering the injury history she's had this season. She's coming back from missing a couple of games. Peters on the year has played in just four games. This will be her fifth and started just three out of a possible 11 as Kate Levitt will look to get something going with a free kick with 20 minutes left in the first half. Right-legged boot from Levitt as this one stretches towards the near side and off the mark as she tried to get maybe a header in there from O'Grady, but Boucher didn't really have to do much work and a goal kick will come up. You are listening to the Beacons Broadcasting Network. I am John Scudris from atop James Cotter Field on the campus of BC High right next to UMass Boston in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts, although today beautiful is the last thing on any of our minds when it comes to the weather or the climate of Boston as this one comes off the tuchus of the referee and it will result in an advantage for the visitors as Hewitt will stretch it towards the far end. Here come the Corsairs trying to get numbers and an odd man rush the other way, but the feed towards the far end is off the mark. Robinson on defense for UMass Boston. They get it through Carly's legs and then an aggressive defensive play. Both players jockeying for the ball and no call smartly by the refs as able to clear this one was Levesque momentarily before a shot comes back in there by number 10, Erica Farias. But Farias' shot is off the mark as diving for that one was Fugil. It'll be Alyssa with a goal kick coming on up. Nineteen and change to go in half number one. We'll have a recap of the first half as well as a look around the Little East Conference at halftime as these two teams will play 90 minutes today. And playing all 90 right there was Julia Massionis. Very aggressive defensive play, sending number two, Kayla Lecano, to the pitch as unable to get control over either, but a good aggressive and physical play as seeing this one shoot off the top of her foot was Alex Levesque. And a, goal, and a throw in, I should say, for Hewitt. Booted forward there by Farias. Comes right back to Erica. She knocks it down with the right leg. Left leg pass for Courtney Hewitt. She goes right to left around Levitt. Tried to split Kara Peters' legs with a soft pass, but it's knocked down by number two. With control is O'Grady. Looking for help. Had none. Tries to split it to the far end. And chasing after this one is Alexander, but she can't keep it in. Out of bounds on UMass Boston, and a throw-in coming up for the Corsairs. The men's soccer team coming into this afternoon's affair down in Dartmouth, undefeated on the year as the Beacons now get advantage with a throw, tossed in on a smart defensive play, looking for help, and then tripped up. We'll see, and it will be a call, and they're going to call it on the Beacons. Tough call as the Beacons were... Aggressive in their nature, but Massionis took a hard dive there. And unfortunately for she and Amy Zombeck's club, it's an advantage for Pacheco, who has control, and the Corsairs. She finds Farias, tries to split the D for D'Ambrusio, but couldn't get there. It's McMinniman's stretch feed around the D for Massionis is off the mark, and Julia's been all over the pitch so far as she tumbles down. It'll be a throw-in for the Beacons. McMinniman does the honors as she gets control to the left of her home bench. Nicole with the only goal of the afternoon. Her first of the season off of a corner kick from Kate Levitt as this one goes right through the legs of O'Grady. But it's beneficial for UMass Boston in the effect that it will have another throw in from closer towards the visiting goal. McMiniman, in fact, is going to let it go and they're going to give it to the much stronger arms of Sam Bendick. Bendick launches this one towards the box over the noggin of Stebor and unable to settle it down there was Natasha or O'Grady. Now Stebor got this one off the top of her foot, but not enough on that one to full Boucher, and it's gobbled up by Madison as the Southampton, Massachusetts native will look to boot this forward. 16 and a half to go as Boucher sees this one trickle off of Peters and off of the chest of D'Ambrusio, who jockeys with Stebor for possession. Stebor now fighting out there with Starkey Cox. And to the near side, here's Farias moving forward. Erica Farias going around the D as Levitt is hapless but to look on. 
unfortunately for the Corsairs, unable to maintain possession yet again. That was number 23, Maggie McCormick, finding Nikki, excuse me, Kayla Lecano into the far end of the field. Pacheco looks for assistance. Farias unable to get there, and now here is Masionis sending it forward for O'Grady, who settles it down, takes it off her face, and could have turned that into a rush the other way, but a smart defensive play by Lecano to get back and assist on D. This stretch feed intended for McCormick is off the mark and able to take control rel rather lack of uh, drama here early on for Fugil as she's able to get that one much like the other ones before any attackers come through. Stretched all the way down for Lecano to head forward. Starkey Cox able to boot it over her head and towards midfield as Kara, excuse me, Nicole McMiniman and Sam Bendick watch this one go out of bounds and a Bendick throw coming up here as it's Stebor knocking it down. Courtney Hewitt trying to fight her for possession. Heading it forward there was number 16, Sarah Pacheco, as Levitt is sandwiched by a couple of defenders. That's D'Ambrusio and Starkey Cox into the far end of the field. Here come the Corsairs until it was knocked down and intercepted by Alexander. So they're going to say out of bounds off of UMass Boston in the Beacon C yet again. A wise defensive play. Just get it out of bounds and regroup as the Corsairs are going to regroup with Katrina Longo, a freshman, excuse me, a junior forward from Bill Ricca. She will come on in and replace Kaylee Birch. So Longo enters in for Birch as the throw in will reconvene and re ensue as it's off of. The Corsairs this time and an opportunity for the Beacons. Far end throw for UMass Boston looking for Masionis. Unable to get her as O'Grady was also in the area. Stebor trying to get there, but she couldn't. And now stretching it forward for Farius, but unable to get there was Erica as it comes out of bounds to the near side. Now Courtney Hewitt fighting for it with McMiniman. Hewitt and... McCormick are right there, but the Beacon's able to come out of it with possession as Levesque gets it towards Sam Bendick, and then a good second effort from Sam on the slide tackle as she takes out the wheels of McCormick and gets it out of harm's way. And now Peters sees this one come right off the face of number 10, Erica Farias, and she's feeling that right now as she's down. Still really in pain there is Erica Farias, but the game plays on as does the broadcast as Stebor unable to get there in front of Starkey Cox, but Kate Levitt can in front of an already dazed Erica Farias. Looks like it might have come off her stomach, actually. She's favoring that stomach. Maybe the wind got knocked out of her. Far end of the field now for Katrina Longo as this one comes to the near end for Starkey Cox. She has got Pacheco with her. If she wants to come towards the near side, she does. Sarah Pacheco was, had a lot of possession time today, and that feed was very poorly executed. Good idea as it comes out of bounds into the bleachers. Pacheco will now have the throw as she'll look for better days ahead as getting this one is D'Ambrusio. She tries to go right through Nicole McMiniman, who tumbles down. Nicole's slow to get up, but she's okay as sending it back into the box. There was Pacheco. Good play by Levesque to send it to Bendick. Bendick looking for Masionis and out of bounds off of Dartmouth, they'll say. The coaching staff yet again disagrees, and they won't get much help from these referees as home cooking here on UMass Boston. Kristen Spain joins the action. She just recently rejoined the team, a midfielder and goalkeeper from Quincy, Massachusetts. The junior enters number 10, in white and blue. Meanwhile, the UMass Boston Beacons and the UMass Dartmouth Corsairs continue along here in the first half with 12 minutes to go. Bendick knocked that one down, and it comes out of bounds off of Sam, so a break here for the Corsairs as they look to get their first real offensive rush since early on in half number one. Knocked down by Pacheco, centered for D'Ambrusio. She couldn't settle it down. Here's Starkey Cox able to keep it off of her foot, then her shoulder, and just entering the game, Kristen Spain able to get it out of harm's way. And then the ref takes one off of the face as this one comes right back towards the Beacons D to clear out of their own half of the field. Stebor and Masionis are there, but unable to get control as it is going to eventually come to Stebor after the Corsairs had it momentarily. Here's Kara Peters. Beacons largely outnumbered in their own zone now, up one to nothing late here in the first half as this one's sent forward. 
Courtney Hewitt, who's been all around the pitch this afternoon, is able to move it to the far end of the field as the Corsairs have not lacked for opportunities or at least rushes, but they just can't get anything on net as this one is knocked down and eventually going to come out of bounds. If that's off UMass Boston, that's a golden opportunity, and it is. A corner kick coming up, the first of the affair for the visiting Corsairs as they'll get an opportunity to get things going here late in the first half with 10 and change to go. We'll see what they decide to do. Right now there's only two Corsairs in the box. They break late. This long lob feed is headed out of harm's way by Sam Bendick. That is that senior mentality, always taking leadership as she comes forward to get it out of there. And now Stebor gets a feed from Masionis. She'll tumble down at the 40. As a good defensive play by... They recently entered Katrina Longo, number four, as this one comes out of bounds, and it'll eventually come off of Stebor. A throw-in coming here for the Corsairs, who just squandered their first corner kick of the afternoon. Here is McMiniman on the near side. She heads this one. Here's Hewitt with control. Courtney keeps it inbounds, looking for help. She finds Pacheco who may have been looking for Farias, but instead she found Kate Levitt of the Beacons. And now with Masionis in the area, they're going to let this one come out of bounds off of Pacheco. And McMiniman and the Beacons will get a throw. They're going to turn it over to Bendick as the last line of defense for the Beacons will quickly move forward to find Kara Peters' head, who tries to head this one towards Masionis, but it comes out of bounds. So just as quickly as the Beacons had the advantage, they give it right back. Pacheco's lob in is jockeyed for possession. Levitt there along with D'Ambrusio and McCormick. McCormick eventually boots it off of Peters' leg, so a throw in for Talia D'Ambrusio. Hewitt unable to knock it down. She tried to do it in midair, and then while Hewitt and McMiniman jockeyed for the ball between their legs, it was D'Ambrusio who got control and then got the hip. She got the hip check at number 11, Kate Levitt, and the Beacons showing their aggressive nature here in the first half. Out, out muscling the visiting team from Dartmouth and then stepping right over Levitt was D'Ambrusio as this is starting to get a little salty here late in the first half as these two teams continue to play a interstate rivalry, both teams hating each other Beyond belief, you wouldn't expect it considering that for many of these teams, for many of these Beacons especially, this will be the first time they play Dartmouth. But over the next four years, something tells me you'll see plenty more of it. There's eight minutes and change left as the save is made by Alyssa Fugel on the far end. And you see Kate Levitt adjusting her cleats after she went through World War III there with Talia D'Ambrusio, the leading goal scorer and point getter for the visitors. His offsides was Masionis. That's why Stebor couldn't go to her. And now the second chance opportunity for Stebor. She gets it away. Natasha penetrates the D. Good light, light, right to left move, but she could not get around the defense. Good play by the visiting Corsairs. This one's sent forward by Levesque for Masionis. Boucher has to come out, and then she gets a little forearm shiver. And she didn't like what she got there from Boucher, or rather from Masionis, but Boucher has to settle things down here and move forward. So this one's starting to look like an old-fashioned backyard brawl, maybe a soccer game you'd have at recess back in the day as these two teams continue to fight for possession. Kate Levitt aggressively playing the ball here as she'll let this one now go for Bendick. Bendick tries to bend it like Beckham. Unfortunately, she couldn't get it to Masionis, and it comes out of bounds off of the Corsairs, as the Beacons will get a throw, coming on in for Sam Bendick to take that opportunity. Beacons lead one to nothing on a goal from Nicole McMiniman early in the first half. Here's Masionis. Julia settles it down. She tries to move it forward for Steve Orr, who gets control. Natasha spins around and sends it, but the Beacons are whistled for offsides. And that's a tough break for the Beacons deep into the opponent's box. But right now with six and change to go, they're happy to be out in front. Still, though, the Corsairs have done a good job keeping possession in the Beacon zone for much of this first half, even if they haven't gotten many scoring opportunities as Peters heads it for Stebor. Knocked down there on a smart play by 
The visiting defenseman Erica Hammond, and now with control is Courtney Hewitt. Hewitt finds D'Ambrusio to the midfield stripe for Farias, and Erica moves forward. Number 10 in white, able to send this one towards the box. Defensively was Bendick coming on in to slide this one out of bounds, and another corner kick coming up. The last one was unsuccessful as Bendick was wise defensively. There's 5.45 to go, so this is a big corner here in the first half. It'll be D'Ambrusio with the corner kick as she raises the left arm to signal she's ready. Sends it towards the far end, but a little too much mustard on that one as Peters lets it go out of bounds. And a Bendick throw-in will come up as the Beacons... Actually, they're going to say it came out of bounds on the baseline, so they're going to say goal kick. So a, beak for, a break for UMass Boston as the Beacons will have an opportunity to boot this one towards midfield. Taking a seat now for the Beacons was Kristen Spain. She'll get a break. And it looks like Kelsey Rushlow will be the midfielder replacing her, freshman from Worcester. Kelsey also plays attacking forward, and that looks like where she'll be right now as she is a rover between those two positions. This one settled down and booted forward by the Corsairs, and now a mortar shot into the air off the leg of Alexander, settled down by Rushlow, or excuse me, by the aforementioned Pacheco as she sends this one towards the net, but it's Fugil able to gobble it up as Farias and Pacheco did a good job getting it into the attacking zone for a Farias shot from well outside the box. She's the one who heads that one down, and Bendick aggressively comes out of her defensive positioning and then falls down. We hope she didn't twist her ankle there. She looks okay as she's up. And the throw-in coming up here for Kayla Lecano. Nothing on that throw from Lecano as it's headed out of bounds from D'Ambrusio. And the Beacon see Sam Bendick yet again get another chance to flash her strength. That one was much better as Rushlow is able to settle it down. But unfortunately, an aggressive defensive play by Farias sees another throw for the Beacons with 3.52 remaining. Sam Bendick has it. The Beacons keep the same 11 out there as they'll try to get things going offensively with five minutes left in half number one. Leading one to nothing on Nicole McMiniman's first of the year. The assist came from Kate Levitt on a corner kick. That in the first 10 minutes of this afternoon's affair. Bendick looking for Peters. Peters able to settle it down but unable to knock it down as it goes right through her and the defense of the Corsairs wisely just gets it out. It came off of Bendick's head, and so it'll be a throw-in for Hewitt. She sees this one deferred by Farias to be taken by D'Ambrusio, but she attempts to find McCormick, and then a smart play by Hewitt to keep it in with the right leg. Coming all the way back for Lecano, she keeps it away from Masionis to her defensive mate who sends it forward, where McCormick and D'Ambrusio both defer to each other, and it results in a Corsair's turnover. Here's Courtney Hewitt trying to go through two defenders. She does, going towards the middle of the field. And now after the Corsairs got things started, it'll be the Beacons finishing things off with two and a half to go here in the first half as Stebor and Peters fight for it. Stebor's tripped up, and they do whistle Farias for the call, and it'll be a Beacons free kick to be taken here by, it looks like, number 13. That will be Carly Robinson, who entered in as a sub. Robinson back there with Bendick and Levesque as Robinson sends it forward. It's knocked off of the cleat of Stebor and fighting for it is Masionis. She had an opportunity in the box on sides, but just to the right of that far side post from Julia Masionis. So the Beacons had a chance to take the 2-0 lead heading into halftime, but couldn't get it. And it remains 1-0 UMass Boston right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. So a goal kick coming up for the Corsairs. They send it forward, trailing by a goal. Less than two minutes to go here in half number one. We'll have halftime here from James Cotter Field before the final 45 minutes as McMiniman keeps it in, but McCormick was there to pick it up. Thankfully, it was Levitt on defense to block the McCormick centering feed, and it comes out of bounds. It'll be a throw-in for the Corsairs. One last chance for Romance in the final 90 seconds of this first half as Hewitt sends it forward for Pacheco. Here is Courtney Hewitt trying to find some help. She sends it towards the box. Knocked down smartly there, and a play made by... Carly Robinson, excuse me, as it's knocked down now on the far end by Lecano. 
Like, kind of looking for Liz Stearns. Stearns moving forward, trying to find Farias. She does. She tries to split the defense for Pacheco, but Fugil, again, aggressive to come out of the inside of the box and get control. And 60 seconds remain here in the first half as the Beacons netminder settles things down. Alyssa Fugil's right-legged boot forward is knocked down and moved forward. Here is D'Ambrusio with possession. Talia centers it forward. Pacheco chasing after it, but the Beacons defense smartly just pinches to keep her away from the net as Fugil comes out to take control. And with 30 seconds to go, the Beacons can just settle things down here, and you'll see Alyssa take her sweet time to get this one forward. Not going to see much on the goal kicks today with the way this weather is attacking the environment as the thick air is penetrating any opportunity to get a long stretch pass, whether it be from the netminder or her teammates, as this one comes off the head of McCormick towards Courtney Hewitt. Just to the left of the 50-yard line with eight seconds left, this one sent into the box for Fugio to gobble up, and that'll eliminate any chance for any fireworks late here in the first half as the whistle sounds to signal the end of these first 45 minutes. So UMass Boston with an early goal from number 22, Nicole McMiniman. For the Ackworth, Georgia native and senior midfielder, it's her first of the season as she puts the Beacons on top early on in half number one. And with that, got the Beacons off to the start they wanted against a tough conference foe from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. So the Beacons lead it one to nothing after 45 minutes to play right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. As they continue the theatrics here of this afternoon's event, we continue along here at halftime. Of course, this redo it for the wall game celebrates Catherine Wall's momentous impact on Beaconville and those that she played with and coached. And right now the Beacons and Nicole McMiniman are doing it for the wall as they lead one to nothing after 45 minutes of play here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. For the Beacons, it was Alyssa Fugel in net for UMass Boston. Did not allow a goal. What else is new on the season? She looks to improve to 4-5-1 and one with a victory today. A 1.62 GAA coming into this afternoon's affair. The freshman has been an absolute godsend. And the East Hampton, Massachusetts native continues to get it done as we move forward here on the halftime show. Let's, we're going to take a look at team stats in a moment. But before we do, let's... Let's take a look at the highlights for UMass Boston from the last time they took on a foe here from Beaconville. I believe that would be the Rhode Island College match just two weeks ago. A 3-0 victory for the Beacons here on the campus of BC High. They'll look to do it again this afternoon as we'll take a look at highlights of their last home game. Hey, um, stop in the short. Stop in the short.
please. Thank you for rejoining us here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Halftime between the Corsairs of Dartmouth and the Beacons of Boston. A one to nothing UMass Boston lead through 45 minutes on the first goal of the season for Nicole McMinniman. Let's take a look at the halftime statistics for the first 45 minutes of this affair as UMass Boston got out to the early advantage. The Beacons with the being dwarfed in shots 13 to 4 as they continue to be outmanned by the visiting Corsairs but it doesn't show up on the scoreboard as UMass Boston has played quite well in their attacking zone and in their own zone defensively limiting those shots to just six shots on goal most of which were from far outside of the box and of little consequence for Alyssa Fugel and her defensive teammates. The Beacons see the visitors have three corners I believe the Beacons had one as well because they did score on one nonetheless UMass Boston out being outmanned both on the pitch and in the corners as they are down 3-1 in corners but for the Beacons defense, it's been a smart play in their defensive zone to prevent any of those corners from resulting in goals. As we take a look around Beaconville, we now have those scores as the volleyball team falls three sets to one to Babson College. The Beavers getting it done at home. The men's soccer team, meanwhile, well, they needed every inch of those 90 minutes to come out on top of the Corsairs men's team one to nothing from Dartmouth. They were tied at nil-nil late in that game. And this terrible weather here in Boston, Massachusetts has forced the postponement of the cross-country and men's and women's tennis matches this weekend. As for the matches throughout the Little East Conference in women's soccer, we of course take a look at the foes for the Beacons, Western Connecticut State. I mentioned earlier on in this broadcast predicted at the beginning of the season to be the top team in the LEC. They have struggled early on but have won today against RIC 3 to nothing. Eastern Connecticut State a 1-0 winner over the Owls of Keene State and Southern Maine trailing Plymouth State 2-1 at the half as these two squads continue their LEC schedules. We have a few more minutes to go before they reconvene for the second half of play here on the campus of BC High in the field of James Cotter. But before we do that, let's take a look at the men's team. Their historic undefeated run continues here in 2015 with a 9-0 win over Southern Maine. Remaining in the first half. One minute. Put your on the little screen. Okay, then you get
Welcome back into the Beacons Broadcasting Network. Still a few minutes to go before the second half of play gets underway with the Beacons out in front one to nothing. I am John Scudras bringing you the halftime show, and we just showed you before that little uh, you know, intermediary into men's soccer, we showed you the LEC scoreboard. And how critical is that LEC scoreboard? Well, you have a chance to take a look at the LEC standings after that. And Eastern Connecticut State, who came out on top of Keene State today, now is 3-0. and They're the only 3-0 and team in the conference, at least for now. A Beacons victory today will leapfrog Keene State in the conference standings and move them along with EastCon as the only undefeated teams in the Little East Conference. Of course, that would include a Dartmouth loss, who's 1-0-1 this season in the conference. So the Beacons with an opportunity to tie Eastern Connecticut at the top of the conference. And who do the Beacons play a week from today? None other than those Eastern Connecticut State women's soccer players. So an opportunity for the Beacons to get a golden leg up on the rest of the competition and then put themselves in the driver's seat in the LEC standings with a matchup against EastCon looming in one week and a matchup against preseason favorite WestCon in two weeks right here from James Cotter Field. So the UMass Boston Beacons seeing some help from the visitors as Keene State falls to Eastern Connecticut State. Both those teams undefeated in the conference coming into this afternoon's affair. Westcon also beat Rhode Island College by a goal. That sends the anchor women to 0-3 and 1-9 and overall. They're no threat. Westcon is a threat. They're now 1-1-1 and in the conference and 7-4 and overall as they have a plethora of in-conference matches remaining here in 2015. And Southern Maine trails Plymouth State by a goal. Both those teams winless in the LEC so far and trailing back behind UMass Boston by multiple games. So the Beacons, with a win today, can put themselves in the driver's seat and control their own destiny to win this conference. So that is something to look forward to if you're a fan of the Beacons, which I assume most of you are. And if you're a fan of the Corsairs, well, you're really in your own uh, driver's seat as well. You're 1-0-1 in the conference, and with a victory, a come-from-behind victory nonetheless today, you'd move to 2-0-1 in the conference with matchups against conference foes Southern Maine as well as Keene State and Plymouth State and the finale of the regular season on Halloween against EastCon looming on the horizon. So plenty of matchups for both of these teams to get back in to the top of the standings, and with a victory today, the Beacons will do just that. So a couple of minutes left before we do hit that second half whistle and for the Beacons in the first half they were outgunned by the Corsairs 13 shots to 6 but it didn't seem that way. Even though the Corsairs controlled possession and the likes of Farias and D'Ambrusio did a tremendous job of settling things down and keeping play in the Beacons half of the field it didn't really seem like Alyssa Fugil had a whole lot of issues in her own zone and in her own box as she continued to play very poised for a freshman netminder, and the Beacons continued to play very well offensively when they got their opportunities, which may not have been many, but they made it worthwhile with the early goal by McMiniman from Levitt giving the Beacons the one nothing lead that they still salvage here with 45 minutes to go. So if the Beacons are able to come out on top, it most likely will be because of that goal as well as their defense as they have played well in their own zone, preventing any cross-field opportunities and cross-field feeds from setting up any offensive scoring chances. What's on the horizon for each of these teams? The Beacons, of course, head to the road. They'll take on Wentworth Institute of Technology, that one on Tuesday, before coming back towards Connecticut to take on Eastern Connecticut State. I mentioned that LEC matchup a week from today. It's critical. And then Colby Sawyer College will round out that road trip a week from Tuesday before the Beacons come back home in two weeks to take on WestCon in another critical LEC game. For UMass Dartmouth, their road heads back to Dartmouth, Massachusetts on Monday for a night matchup against Fitchburg State. They then rejoin the Little East Conference for a matchup on Saturday at Southern Main, and then the following Wednesday it'll be at Roger Williams University before rounding out their home slate with a matchup two Saturdays from now against the Owls of Keene State. So as the Beacons are set to play, they have about 75 seconds left on the clock before we get the second half underway. The Beacons nonetheless are ready and rearing to go as that offensive trio of Massionis, 
Levitt and O'Grady are out there at the 50-yard line. Now the Corsairs are out as well. And we are ready to go. Looks like we'll get things started perhaps a little early. We have seen D'Ambrusio, number 12 in stripes. She has been the most aggressive player for the visitors, along with number 10, Erica Farias. Both those players at the top of their team's scoring list, along with number 19, Abby Silva. However, the Beacons have done a good job in all of those scoring chances, limiting opportunities in the box. Most of the scoring chances coming from outside of the box, and that's exactly what you're looking for if you're the team on top. So here are the Beacons as Levitt sends it in off the opening tip, and the Beacons trying to get things going aggressively on offense, trying to stem the tide in which they were outshot 13-6 to in the first half. In the attacking zone, Kara Peters can't settle it down, nor can Kate Levitt. Steepor tried to send it back for help in the form of number 13. That's Rushlow, but the Beacons unable to do so. Excuse me, that was Robinson. The Beacons unable to do so, and now Carly will get the pass in. Carly missed the last couple of games, along with Kara Peters, due to injury, as both those team players come back for Amy Zombeck's team. And now Steepor tries to center it for assistance, but couldn't get there as she was looking for number nine, Cassie Levesque. Cassie today spent most of the time in her defensive zone as she'll head back towards midfield line as she jockeys for possession with number 13, Megan Cole. Abby Silva sends it forward. Unfortunately for the Beacons, they can't get any sort of offensive rush prolonged here through the first 45-plus as this one is taken into the near side but out of bounds off of the foot of number two, Kayla Lecano, for a Beacons throw. Coming on in is Robinson to take this throw as the Beacons will try to get something going. They have Stepor and Levesque to the near side. There's the throw in looking for Stepor. She knocks it down, tries to get assistance from Asionis, but it does instead come out of bounds. And the ensuing goal kick will come on up as Boucher will defer here to her defensive partner. Beacons leading one to nothing on a Nicole McMiniman goal, the first of the season for number 22 in white as the Beacons got that early goal on a corner kick off the head from the goal kick and the noggin of Stepor. A throw in here for the visiting Corsairs as this one's headed out of bounds by Levesque and back and forth they go out of bounds for another toss by Kaylee Birch. Birch a starter for this visiting squad led by Kate Thomas in her first season. As UMass Boston moves forward defensively, Seaport jockeying for possession, gets it to Levesque, and it comes out of bounds off the foot of Robinson. I am joined now by typically our director or producer and now color commentator, Seth Orensky. And Seth here as the Corsairs move forward. The Beacons may have been outgunned in the first half, time of possession and shots, but they got the lead on the scoreboard, and that's what you're looking for. Yeah, and that's what you have to do when you're a team who's struggling. But obviously with a game like today, we do it for a while. The Beacons have a little bit of an emo emotional lift. Um, a lot of alumni, a lot of players who put in – a lot of time and a lot of effort during years where they were a little bit leaner um, than this current period under head coach Amy Zombeck here to support their team. Beacons also playing at home, didn't have to wake up as early, but you have to take advantage of your opportunities. Nicole McMenamin, a very pretty back flick on that corner kick, and while UMass Dartmouth had the majority of the shots, they've been taking shots from distance. One big thing to watch here in the second half, the wind is with the Beacons back, so UMass Boston might be looking for those long-range aerial shots. UMass Dartmouth is going to have a little bit more difficulty passing the ball in the air as the ball is going to just start blowing back towards them. Julia Massionis and Erica Hammond colliding with each other there. It looked like Erica is favoring her left wrist. She still is, but in soccer, the wrist is really a moot point as getting an opportunity to... Get the free kick. Here are the Corsairs, and that's Kaylee Birch sending this one forward, headed by Stu excuse me by Natasha Stebor as she looks to continue to fight for possession there with Farius. It comes out of bounds in front of Courtney Hewitt, and the Beacons yet again. The wind might be helping these teams, as you mentioned. It seems like whoever is moving left to right on this field seems to have much more success, not only in keeping possession, but in their aerial aerial passes. And with a one nothing lead, that's exactly what the Beacons need. But Seth, I want you to talk about. You mentioned the, you know, we, we do it for the wall campaign here and how important Catherine was to this institution. Just, you know, echo some of the sentiments of what you felt from talking to folks in the athletic department and around these teams and what they're feeling right now with the ceremony that's been going on. 
Well, I was actually fortunate enough to have met Catherine. Uh, she was an assistant coach in her first season, my first full year here at UMass Boston, as the Beacons will have a corner kick here looking to add to their lead. Um, Catherine was just such a a fun individual, had so much energy. She was a player that her – or she was a coach that her players – um, really loved, a great friend, a very loyal person to UMass Boston Athletics, playing 12 seasons. That takes a lot um, It takes a lot of grit. It puts a lot of pressure on your body. Uh, as as the, Levitt sends this one in, it's headed out by Beacon's Kara Peters, and then Levitt will send it towards the far end for a header opportunity and out of bounds and a goal kick to ensue. In that case, a little bit of the wind helping out. Um, but one of the, the most impressive things about Wall was that she always kept a positive spirit despite going through three bouts of cancer um, before her 30th birthday. And that's just something um, last year I interviewed her about um, her third bout and how she was staying positive. And she just talked about the need to not only stay positive, but to be a, a beacon of hope um, for maybe some women who were going through it in their first time or maybe women who would go through it in the future. A role model throughout the three bouts of cancer, which, I mean, it's a harrowing experience to go through it once, much less three times. And Catherine was one of those people who would always put a smile on her teammates, her coaches, even the other student athletes. Uh, there was a very nice article written about Catherine by a student who was a freshman her senior year, and he just talked about how she was a leader and someone everyone looked up to even though we didn't know her. Um, so that's sort of the lasting impact of Catherine, who was nominated and elected to the Hall of Fame at the minimum five years after she graduated here from UMass Boston. So here is Farias with an opportunity, but it's sent out on a smart defensive play by the Beacons, and Kate Levitt in there on the action, as well as Cassie Levesque, and eventually this one is sent forward from the left leg of Robinson, and now we'll get a whistle. And, you know, I think... You talk about the impact she had both on and off the field, and you talk about playing three sports, but really I think the biggest sentiment is that three bouts with cancer and always keeping the positive attitude, always exhibiting and exuding energy to her, her disciples and her teammates and, and, and the students that she coached. So it's really something. I don't think there's a single person out there in, a, in the world today who hasn't been affected by cancer. You know, someone they love, someone they know. So we all know what the Wall family and the friends of Catherine are going through right now. And it's really a tremendous achievement for, uh, you know, this institution to continue to surround her and her family. And as well as Caitlin Morse, what, what that young woman did to raise $40,000 for, uh, you know, for Catherine and for her family. That is unbelievable stuff. Yeah, and this won't be the only We Do It For Wall game this year. The Beacon softball team plays their annual fall ball game on the 12th of October. That's, uh, I believe it's Veterans Day, maybe Columbus Day, one of the uh, national holidays. Um, and they'll be raising money and selling T-shirts. The women's hockey team will be doing a game as well. And Wall didn't just make him an impact on the three teams she played on. She made an impact on all the other teams as well. So it's, it's a really um, nice event. Um, you talk about everyone being affected by cancer, and it's 100% true. But to be affected by breast cancer, um, which is one of the more difficult um, cancers to deal with for a lot of reasons, um, it was very tough. And it's just nice to see the Beacons came out this season. They started with a, a, a championship in the tournament um, up at Castleton State. It's something they'd never done in the middle of the season, an in-season tournament. And then to come out here in their home field on a – day where they're without Elisa Brooks, one of their senior captains, their top players, where a lot of players are banged up and to play so well at this point. This would mean a lot uh, for UMass Boston to get a win. I mean, this Beacons team lost 6-1. to one. They didn't have Kara Peters. They didn't have Carly Robinson on Thursday. A lot of these players are playing with significant injuries. They're just gutting it out, and that's a lot of what Catherine Wall did. Is Looks that. like we're going to get a call in the box. That's a big call if it's against UMass Boston. Well, there was a trip right inside the box. It's going to be interesting to see. The UMass Dartmouth fans have not been happy with the head referee throughout this one. Um, as Krista McCann came up and said advantage, it looks like she's going to give the foul just outside. John, she was fully two to three feet within the box. Um, so that's a big break for UMass Boston. As This is a dangerous opportunity. Whoever takes this free kick, and it looks like it will be uh, D'Ambrosio, has to get enough on it to counteract the wind that's directly into her face. 
Yeah, Deanne Bruce yells the team's leading point getter and goal scorer as she'll try to continue that success here on this free kick. Now she'll settle the ball down as it moved a little bit. This game huge for both teams with Keene State losing to EastCon earlier as this one sent towards the net off the crossbar. It's still in harm's way. Fugil able to get there, can't settle it down. And now on her second effort, she tumbles over with possession. So the Beacons getting the benefit of that crossbar as they get that huge save with a little help from Alyssa's friend. So UMass Boston with 35 minutes to go dodges a major bullet there to keep up their 1-0 lead here in the second half of play as this one sent forward now from midfield. And now here come the Corsairs with a little momentum at their backs as they move forward to the far side. Centering feed in front, knocked down by Fugil as she was in the right place at the right time. And John, that's one of the hardest um, set pieces to defend against because not only could Dean Bruzio have shot that and she put a tremendous shot right off the bar, but she had an option to her left where they could have tried a trick play. She had five players out wide who were looking to make runs, putting a lot of pressure on Beacon's defenders. And just unfortunate, the Beacons have taken advantage of really their only opportunity outside of a, a great chance late in the half from um, Julian Massionis that went just wide. UMass Dartmouth hasn't had that many great chances, and that's one they're really going to regret if this game ends up staying at this scoreline of one nothing. So it looks like Nicole McMiniman will enter the game as she will cruise on in and take in a seat's Carrie Alexander. I was going to say this game's so huge because EastCon beating Keene State. The Beacons win. They're tied with EastCon at 3-0 and atop the conference, and they play them next week. So an opportunity to really control your own destiny coming up. Yeah, and I don't know if this Beacons team necessarily can compete um, for another um, conference title in the regular season. I'm just not sure if they're ready to go on the road and beat teams like Eastern Connecticut State at their own field, like Keene State on their own field, and they still have a very difficult test against Western Connecticut State. But to open the conference season at 3-0, despite all of these really um, not great results on the road against teams in the past that they've done very well against in non-conference, just shows this team's resolve. You can struggle all you want in non-conference if you come in and you win your conference games, you put yourself into the postseason, and once you get to the postseason, maybe it's a game like this where both teams only get one chance. If you can come away with it, you're looking at upset bids throughout, and the Beacons right now doing a great job of ensuring not only they're going to make a conference tournament, maybe that they'll be hosting a conference game. If they can sneak ahead of UMass Dartmouth, they just need to have one win against the Western, Eastern Connecticut, or Keene States of the world, and they'll be in that top four, a really good spot. Facing a lot of adversity early on, losing Chris Layden to graduation, losing the great players like Kara Peters to injury and here you are, I have the chance to go 3-0 and as this one's wide of the net off the long stretch shot from Farias, or excuse me, that was D'Ambrusio. And you look at Dartmouth at the same time at 1-0-1, at a win today, and, and they're right in it going into the second half of their LEC schedule. So both of these teams, despite not hitting maybe the fanfare that the Connecticut teams got early on in the season, are right in it as they trail, or the Beacons lead right now 1-0. Yeah, and UMass Dartmouth is a team that's trying to get over the hump. The Beacons are trying to stay at an elite level after three consecutive um, conference regular season titles, two trips to the LEC championship game, and their first ever championship win. I don't think the Beacons can be considered a middle-of-the-pack team, even if they're not necessarily at that same level this year. UMass Dartmouth, though, they've been that fifth team in the conference for four or five years now and haven't gotten past that. This is a big chance for them to maybe make a run to a championship game. O'Grady with a chance there from outside the box, but the right-legged strike is gobbled up by Boucher, and she makes the save with 31 and a half to go as she sends this one towards the near side bench, and that one out of bounds. So a bad boot there from Boucher as the Beacons will get a throw, and it looks like Robinson will defer to Levesque. And that one's going to come right back for Carly. Well, you look at the goalie coach immediately coming out and telling her goaltender the wind's not only whipping in her face, it's also whipping towards this near sideline. So in that case, you have to go away with it, so you're keeping the ball in play and keeping UMass Boston from getting chances. Cassie Levesque sends this one wide of the net, to say the least, out of bounds. Both teams struggling with the effects of the wind, and you've seen it all afternoon long from the goalies on goal kicks as it's been a tumultuous afternoon to try to get it anywhere beyond 40 yards down the field as this one sent 
by Birchie, and now with an opportunity for the Corsairs to move forward. They'll try to get something going. They've had a couple of chances here in the second half, but for the most part, the Beacons have limited those chances to outside the box, bad percentage opportunities. And now Steeport will try to get a good one, as she could not get it forward for Masionis. Intercepted and moved to the near side off the leg of Hewitt and out of bounds for a Beacons throw. Yeah, that's some miscommunication. Jacqueline O'Grady has to be more vocal there. She was all alone on the back side. If Steve Orr could have cut back and put it um, in front of O'Grady, she might have been gone, but O'Grady didn't seem to be calling for the ball, so Steve Orr took the only option she thought she had, which was Massionis double-teamed. Last time out here at home against Rhode Island College, the Beacons were flagrant abusers of offsides as they were just really off their game in the attacking zone for much of the first half of play. We haven't seen very many offsides on the Beacons today. I'm wondering if Amy Zombeck really worked on that and knowing where you are positionally over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, well, I also think this UMass Dartmouth team isn't as afraid of the Beacons using that long, uh, drawn-out offsides trap uh, as they were going with a rookie goaltender who needed all the help she could get looking at a much more competent goaltender today in Madison Boucher. Yeah, Boucher, the sophomore from Southampton, has played well. She allowed just the one goal from McMiniman on the corner in the first 10 minutes of this match, and since then, she has stood tall despite facing some good opportunities from O'Grady and company. Massionis, the one who just booted that towards her, had a golden opportunity late in the first half that went just awry as Boucher able to make the save on that shot. Yeah, but on the same side... Uh, with Massionis, and we're talking about Julia here and not her um, sister Ashley, who is also on the team. Haven't seen her in today's action. I think Julia's come a really long way since the last time that we saw her. She's picked up her play, had a goal in that game and an assist, but she's looked more confident, more aggressive, and the Beacons need that, uh, taking some pressure away from Jacqueline O'Grady. Carrie Alexander still needs that first goal to open the floodgates. Nicole McMiniman with her first and Natasha Stebor has been the Beacon's second leading goal scorer this year with two goals. Yeah, that game against Rhode Island College, it seemed like it was the O'Grady and Stebor show most of the time offensively. So far today, though, we've seen Massionis really come through. Kate Levitt show her playmaking ability from the corner as well as on the pitch. So the Beacons certainly rounding out their game as they move to the second half of this Little East Conference schedule. And now on the far side... Moving forward with it are the Corsairs. Farias looking for assistance, but a good aggressive play by Bendick as she continues to play poised defensively. Even when she gets out of position, she's fast enough to get right back in where she needs to be. And Sam is the only four-year senior on this team. She's the only player who was on the team when Catherine Wall was an assistant, and I think she really uh, is feeling the emotions more than any other player on this Beacons team. And she's had a really nice game, a couple nice slide tackles in that first half as we'll now see Kerry Alexander check in for Julia Massionis. And that's one nice thing about this Beacons team. You don't have Krista Layden or Amanda Pugliese, Erica Groofy, those great offensive options who are all seniors. But this Beacons team goes a little bit deeper because everyone's a little bit less experienced. So you're getting fresher legs in during that 70th, 80th minute when maybe you're defending a one-goal lead. And now Abby Silva tangles up there in the attacking zone, and the Beacons... Seeing no call as Alex Levesque tangles up with Abby Silva, uh, the team leader in points tied with D'Ambrusio. And no call in the box as this one comes out towards midfield. Go Grady, settle it down. She thought that it was going to be Steepor getting it. And then Jacqueline collides with two Corsairs and it allows Natasha to get control. She does everything on her own here, getting around two defenders as Farias is unable to pick her pocket. And now here's... Levesque sending it forward for the chase from Nicole McMiniman, and nobody's going to beat Nicole in a race as she gets there first towards the baseline, sends it towards the net, but it's knocked down and gobbled up there by Boucher. Nicole McMiniman has wheels to burn, and she showed it there yet again. Yeah, Nicole, a junior college transfer who joined the Beacons last year. She's looked a lot more comfortable this season, and that's a tremendous play not only to get to that ball, which very few players would be able to, but to wisely try to co uh, cross that over, either get a corner kick, maybe provide a bobble where some other player can run onto it. If she tries to stop that and keep her momentum in bounds, she's going to either overrun that ball or dribble it right out of bounds. A wise decision there. Also, talk about the physicality. It's really picked up here in the second half, and Krista McCann showing that to get any kind of free kick or a penalty kick, you're really going to have to have draw a blatant foul. As that last play by... Alex Levesque, it, it was more of a 50-50 call than a blatant one, but see a lot of referees at Division Three give that to teams 
maybe not in a conference game with 25 minutes left, but seen it ha called a lot this season already. Liz Stearns was looking for Erica Farias, intercepted by Stebor. She'll go down right in front of the ref, and she's got to call that one as the Beacons will get the free kick. Well, it's a little easier to call it when it's right at the midfield mark rather than close to the 18-yard box. But, yeah, you can't foul someone right in front of the referee. And it's not an easy job to ref in these conditions. As long stretch feed from the free kick eludes O'Grady, and it's taken by Madison Boucher, who will look – to the far side of the field from some assistance. I think she's going to take some of the tutelage she got to learn. Kick it to the far end so that the wind takes it towards midfield as she does. So the Beacons trying to get something going. Peters over there along with McMiniman. It's sent by Bendick up towards the Beacons attacking zone. But unable to get there was O'Grady. And Alexander also attacking here for Amy Zombeck's club as Levesque sends it forward with a long stretch pass, but unable to catch up to that one is Alexander, and Boucher takes it. We have 24 minutes and 45 seconds to go, so we're getting to that halfway point of the first half, and the Beacons leading one to nothing. They've led ever since the first 10 minutes of this affair on a McMiniman goal, her first of the season. But when you lead just one to nothing, even if you have all the momentum on your side, it's still a white-knuckle affair as... The Beacons could see this game turn on its end by just one rush the other way. Well, and it's interesting. We talked about the Beacons' flexibility during the Rhode Island College game. We saw Carly Robinson move um, from the back line to the midfield when the Beacons were trying to generate offense. And today, the Beacons going with a different center back pairing. Alexandria Lavex in there with Carly Robinson. Elisa, Elisa Brooks is supposed to be the top choice center back, joined by either Robinson or Sam Bendick to start the season. With the Beacons changing it up, Levesque a more physical player, and Sam Bendick a little bit more speed. So that's creating some opportunities. And here you see Bendick winning the foot race and helping Alyssa Fugil right there at the edge of her box. Yeah, Fugil came aggressively out as she is prone to do, and Bendick just slowing down the, the attacker just enough for the freshman netminder to get there as this one settled down by Nicole Starkey-Cox but intercepted by Peters. Stebor from midfield was looking perhaps to find Levesque streaking up the field but unable to get it to her as Cassie was waiting. Now Cassie will boot this one forward with the left leg and she just got that out of harm's way and all the way down for Boucher to take control in the box. 23-20 to go and the Beacons still lead one to nothing right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network for Seth Orensky, I am John Scudris, and excited to bring you this action, even if the weather is not beautiful. It's been an absolutely beautiful afternoon for soccer, as well as to honor Catherine Wall and her impact on the community here in Boston and beyond, as settling this one down is McMiniman to move forward. Ooh, getting clipped there was Alexander, no call, as she tripped over the defender's legs. Kara Peters can't settle it down, but moving forward is Farias. She gets her pocket picked by Peters, and Kara gets it to Stebor. Stebor spins around, look perhaps for Levesque. Instead, she'll defer for Robinson, who sends it forward off of, uh, just off of the foot of Alexander. Actually, not sure she actually made contact with it as she looked to deflect it towards O'Grady. And here's Boucher with yet another boot. 22 and change left. Beacons... Still clinging to a slight lead, as here is Courtney Hewitt. Hewitt towards the far end of the field, and moving forward for the Corsairs there was Erica Hammond. She sends it forward, looking for D'Ambrusio. Can't get there. And there's Levesque whiffing on that one, although she got just enough of it to get it towards the near side. It comes out of bounds, and now eventually taken by Levesque yet again. This is Alex Levesque sending it forward, looking for Alexander. Now Cassie trying to pinch in. Unfortunately for the Beacons, a big collision right outside of the box as Kate Levitt took the brunt of that one and hops right back up. Meanwhile, moving forward are the Beacons looking for help. There was Alexander, but couldn't get it to O'Grady. Pacheco able to settle it down. McMiniman pinching in, unable to get there in front of Pacheco. And Kara Peters now with possession. And Kate Levitt was absolutely run into by a UMass Dartmouth player who should have been whistled for the foul, but Levitt sort of in the same mold as Marina Kelly. She's not only a tremendous player, but she's big and strong, so she stood up, didn't get the foul call. On the other side, the UMass Dartmouth player was down for an additional 10 to 15 seconds. Levitt's another player who hasn't scored yet this season, but she's created a ton of chances, picked up her first assist of the year 
the other night at Salem State and has an assist in today's game. She's a player who just needs that first goal to maybe come away with two or three. Sam Bendick coming in on the offensive side of the field as she was able to set up what may be a rush for O'Grady, but she can't settle that one down. Good defense there by Kayla Lecano, the most diminutive player on this pitch at four foot eleven. But she certainly plays bigger as coming on into the field yet again is Massionis. She'll give O'Grady a chance to catch her breath with 20 minutes and 35 seconds to go in half number two. And you can see the Beacons continuing to try to sub out those frontline players to see if they can maybe get a step on that back four of UMass Dartmouth. A second goal would be huge right now for UMass Boston, especially with the wind going against UMass Dartmouth. There might only be one more goal in this game if we get that. Abby Silva takes a seat for Maggie McCormick, who played about one half of the first 45 minutes as this one comes out of bounds from midfield of the foot of the Beacons. So a goal kick coming up for, I believe, Lecano and the Corsairs. You said it. Less than 20 minutes to go, but still anything can happen. Just one break goes one way or the other, and that's your ball game, folks, as Lecano settles this one down to try to Send it forward and get the rush going for the Corsairs. The wind's going to keep this one on the near side of the field, and the head of Seaport is going to send it out of bounds for a throw-in by Courtney Hewitt and the Corsairs, as number eight in stripes will come on over and look for assistance in the form of one of her teammates as she sends this one forward. Probably had a better chance to get somebody open, but then D'Ambrusio comes through with control, and then... Yeah, if that was a field goal kick, it's good, but unfortunately we're playing soccer, and that one is over the crossbar for a goal kick. D'Ambrusio seems to be the one player you just can't give any room to. Every time she's given space, she's created some, some good chances. Hit the crossbar earlier on in this half on a great free kick from about 22 yards out. Um, see Kate Levitt will take probably a pretty short rest here with Kristen Spain spelling her for maybe four to five minutes like she did in the first half. For the Beacons... They need to find a better way there maybe to double team. Anytime D'Ambrosio has the ball, they need her to give it up. Abby Silva has the same amount of points and the same amount of assists. She hasn't looked nearly as dangerous. The Beacons have a chance. Yes, they do as trying to get in front of the defense there was Alexander, but it's booted out of bounds, and you mentioned it. D'Ambrosio may have the same amount of points as Silva, but she dwarfs her in shots 27-18 to 18, and shots on goal 13-8, to 8, and that's just coming into this afternoon's affair, so she certainly improved those numbers over the last 70 minutes. So the Beacons with possession now. Here's an opportunity for Robinson on the throw, and a golden opportunity for the Beacons in the box as getting this is Julia Massionis. It went right through her legs, and a good defensive play by Hewitt as number 8 in stripes is able to play keep away from 8 and White, and a throw in again for Robinson. Yeah, Robinson's got to try to get a little bit more air under that. He didn't get enough air on the first one to take the high bounce the Beacons were looking for. Here is Carly's opportunity, and this one came over the head of Massionis, but a break for UMass Boston as Hewitt boots it out of bounds and a corner kick for the Beacons. And they'll try to do deja vu all over again, having scored their first and only goal of this affair from the corner. A lot of miscommunication with Kate Levitt, their normal corner kick taker. No one knew who was going to take it. Finally, Natasha Stebor will come over the near side. Yeah, Natasha with an opportunity to get this thing going. And you would like to see Kate, although now Natasha's going to be joined by Levesque. And we'll see what they decide to do. I think Natasha's going to be the one to take this nonetheless, as now... Alex gets control, tries to move right to left. The Beacons with the wind, maybe just trying to set things up. Long stretch feed for McMiniman looking for her second, but she couldn't get it, and she got it on that in-between hop, and it just shot up into the arms of Boucher. Yeah, the Beacons trying to go with a little bit of a trick play. They're trying to get cutesy in that situation. If I'm coaching, I try to just keep it simple, throw it into the box, hope you get a bounce. Beacons have the advantage of knowing the ball's going to get to the box probably over the first defender. Um, but still a, a nice chance nonetheless with McMiniman looking for her second goal of the day. I wonder how much effect on that decision the wind had. It's moving from the far side towards the side where the corner was taking. Perhaps a stretch feed on the corner, just not in the cards. Well, you also wonder if Kate Levitt's in there, if the Beacons go with a more traditional corner kick as well. So Levitt just went to the bench maybe a minute before that corner kick. So for Kate Levitt taking a seat, she was replaced by... Kristen Spain, and so for UMass Boston now, 16 minutes to go, a one-goal lead. They're in their own zone. Things aren't as easy as they may have looked when we began this second half of play. 
The Corsairs are going to do everything they can to get every inch of terrain on goal as this one stretches towards Fugil but out of bounds, and that results in a goal kick, I believe, as it came off of the Corsairs last. John, things aren't as easy necessarily, but UMass Boston outshot in that first half 13-4. to In this half, I don't think UMass Dartmouth has more than three or four shots on goal, whereas the Beacons, it's four total. I think it's got to be pretty even, a much more even half because of the win. Maybe the Beacons making some uh, tactical adjustments as well. The one thing about Little East Conference games and about games in a rivalry like this, it's never over till it's over. Last season, UMass Dartmouth led at home 2-1 to one in the 80th minute. Krista Layden hit a penalty kick in the 83rd minute, and then it was Natasha Stebor with 12 seconds left in regulation. So if UMass Dartmouth has 10 seconds left, this game is still in hand. Meanwhile, Alexander took that one right off the foot of Liz Stearns and had an opportunity for the near side post. It did go out of bounds, but a good play by Kerry to get something as Jacqueline O'Grady will re-enter, and she will spell, well, I'm not sure exactly yet, looks and it like looks like McMiniman. Yeah, and you see the Beacons immediately sending Alexander wide left. Alexander has great pace, put O'Grady just behind Masionis, who's been serving as the lone center forward, and that provides, if Masionis can serve that center forward role of collecting the ball and holding it up, then you have two very, very fast um, winger slash forwards coming in to really push the paces. They try to keep those fresh legs in there, and we'll see Kate Levitt check in for Stebor. Yeah, and Kate Levitt along with Julia Masionis and Jacqueline O'Grady, all freshmen, and yet being relied on to produce so much offense for this team as Zombeck sees O'Grady go towards the far side of the box, but unfortunately with that shot off the near end post, unable to get it going as it's another opportunity for Kayla Lecano and the Corsairs to clear. It's really good defending by Lecano. First, to avoid giving up the foul, to avoid going to ground, and then second, to keep pushing O'Grady wide. Really didn't have any kind of angle on that shot attempt. This one out of bounds off the beacons. Throw in coming, taken by Hewitt. Courtney trying to get control, but Levitt was there to send it out of bounds, and deja vu as the throw in will come really from whence it came as number 14. Liz Stearns with possession, and she'll have to find a new ball as this one trail trickled all the way towards the near-end bleachers. So Stearns with the throw, 13 and a half to go here in half number two as it's knocked down with the chest of O'Grady. She gets her pocket picked, though, by D'Ambrusio, but a good aggressive hip check there by O'Grady. They're letting him play as this one sends the ball right back into the box for Boucher. Far end of the field, Pacheco finds Starkey Cox right back to Sarah. Pacheco to the far end moving forward. Trying to center this one. Here's Starkey Cox getting possession. She will move forward for Farias, but Farias can't settle it down as it's intercepted by Levitt. Now the Beacons see Peters send it all the way downfield. We're chasing after it are the duo of Massionis and Lecano before Boucher is able to take control. And right now, UMass Boston isn't generating any shot chances, but they keep putting the ball into the box, around the box, trying to create an opportunity. It's not only killing clock, it's taking away some of the field position for UMass Dartmouth. Every single time the mi it's being pushed back to the back four, it's so much harder to get that combination play when you can't put the ball in the air. And UMass Dartmouth feeling a little bit of the pressure down one in the late goings of this game. Hewitt gets it from Stearns, and oh, a good play defensively there by Levesque, and then she shoves Stearns to the ground. Not sure how much of that was uh, aided by the slipperiness of the field, but the Beacons nonetheless continue to play physical defense. Yeah, that was actually a surprising call. Not that I have any issue with it, just that it was enough to warrant a foul in this very physical second half. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised. I didn't even call it a foul because I didn't see it coming with the way they've been calling it here through the first uh, you know, three quarters of this game, but so far the Beacons have continued to play aggressive, and they've gone away with it, so why not keep doing it over the last 12 minutes as this one's headed out of bounds by Robinson in another throw coming up here for Hewitt. In fact, it's not going to be Courtney Hewitt. As she's going to be spelled here by Silva. The team leader in points, along with D'Ambrusio, will replace number eight, Courtney Hewitt, and Silva will send this one in to be gobbled up by the chest of Starkey Cox. She's looking for D'Ambrusio, who goes around the D before being manned up there smartly by O'Grady, and this one cleared by number, or excuse me, by Kristen Spain before it can be knocked down by number two. That was the aforementioned Lecano, and she sends it forward. 
Fugil comes on out to gobble this one up just on the lip of the box there with 11 minutes to go. It's one to nothing, UMass Boston still here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. For Seth Orensky, I'm John Scudris, and that was Alyssa Fugil sending it forward. A lot of boot on that one as she sends it all the way towards the 30-yard line before Lecano has to send it out of bounds. So a break for the Beacons with less than 11 to go. They'll get a throw in the attacking zone. And that's a great seven, eight-minute run there from Kristen Spain. Spain doesn't necessarily have the technical skills. She doesn't have the same conditioning after missing preseason workouts, joined the team two weeks ago. But she gives three or four players a chance to get a rest. And now the Beacons will have their, their top 11 who are healthy available over these last 10 minutes. As I think Nicole McMiniman is the only starter uh, not in the game right now for UMass Boston. And she's up on her feet, ready to go back in once the coaching staff beckons. Meanwhile, Robinson trying to send this one in towards the box. She does, but it went right through Massionis as it will be knocked out of harm's way momentarily by Lecano. And the Beacons are going to get called for the foul there inside of the attacking box. Yeah, that was Steve Or The Beacons are naturally a pretty physical team because they don't have that same technical skill they've had in years past. But if the referees aren't going to call it, if you're not going to pull out the card, there, there's really no impetus to take away that physicality. So UMass Boston's been able to get away with stuff all across the field. Um, nothing necessarily dirty, but definitely a higher level of physicality than I'm used to seeing here in Division Three women's soccer. Yeah, McMinimid enters in for Alexander as the Beacons get some more speed out there and, as you mentioned before, get their starters fully out there as UMass Boston with the final nine and a half minutes to go, leading one to nothing. Here, this one comes out of bounds off of the leg of Massionis. Julia couldn't settle it down whilst keeping possession as this throw in by Lecano is going to go to D'Ambrusio eventually, but it comes out of bounds off of her left leg from the feed of number 16, Sarah Pacheco. So Robinson on the near side looking for the throw-in. She does. She's looked pretty good on these throw-ins as she replaced Sam Bendick on the near side as the primary uh, person throwing them in because Bendick is playing on the far side here in the second half. Meanwhile... Here is Silva, who hasn't done much today despite leading the team in points. She looks for her fellow team leader, D'Ambrusio, but she couldn't settle it down as it's cleared out of the way by Levesque. And now a whistle, and UMass Boston getting called here late in the second half. And this is a dangerous spot depending on how much wind there is in this instance. We've seen a pretty big leg out of the diminutive Lecano. As we'll see. Number two in stripes, that is Kayla Lecano. It comes for Native as she'll get an opportunity at 4'11 to send this one towards the box. She does, stretched over the defense of UMass Boston, but also over the attackers of the Corsairs as Fugil gets a goal kick as it's out of bounds. Well, that's a numbers game. UMass Dartmouth keeping two defenders back to deal with Jacqueline O'Grady. So Lecano only had seven options versus the nine defenders and Alyssa Fugil, and that time the Beacons did a nice job of staying with their man on the runs. Like Kano didn't really have a player to pick out on that instance. Meanwhile, that goal kick resulted in a turnover as Robinson was unable to get it to midfield, but O'Grady, with a little help from her friends, is able to move forward with possession. Unfortunately for Jacqueline, she was outsped there by Liz Stearns, who showed her wheels defensively in good positioning, and now Silva off the throw in from Stearns. Silva looking for D'Ambrusio. It missed her. Pacheco couldn't get there. And Levesque sends it forward for Massionis. Massionis, another aggressive play on Lecano, results in a throw in out of bounds off of the Beacons. They'll give it to Stearns to toss in. And it will be actually a free kick, they're going to say, as Lecano will give this one a boot over to the far end. And now here comes Pacheco with possession. Sarah whiffed on that one. Doesn't look intentional, but meanwhile she'll get positioning yet again in possession of the ball to the midfield line as this one towards Pacheco. Pacheco sends it forward, knocked down by Starkey Cox. She's looking for assistance. She's doubled up there on defense. Peter's in the area. Meanwhile, towards the lip of that box, it's unable to get through. It has to come back towards Farias, who boots that one way out of here wide of the net and way too high as that had no chance of hitting the back of the twine and with six and a half minutes to go, Fugil's having some issues getting it out of the netting, which only helps the Beacons kill some clock. Yeah, as long as it doesn't look like you're attempting to waste time on purpose and I don't think I've seen that yet here at the Beacons temporary home field at James Cotter Field. 
Um, first season playing here at BC after playing at UMass Boston for years. And honestly, that's a, a wise move if you're a goaltender, even if you know exactly how to get it out. Just take a few extra ticks off the clock. Remember last year it was just 12 seconds left that the Beacons needed to score the game-winning goal in a thrilling 3-2 comeback win. UMass Dartmouth only has 5 minutes and 50 seconds left in this one. Yeah, we'll hope there's no comebacks today as Robinson will get the throw. She'll look for Masionis or O'Grady, and this one, in fact, deflected out by the left foot of Silva. And it'll be another opportunity for Robinson. The clock keeps ticking. Beacons will do this all day. 5.30 to go as O'Grady takes it off the chest. She'll look for help in the form of Stepor, but unable to get there as Lecano clears. Silva and D'Ambrusio both collide as getting possession now is McCormick. She finds Starkey Cox, who just sends this one forward for the attackers to chase. As coming up big on this one is D'Ambrusio, but she couldn't get possession in front of Levesque. And with five and change to go, it'll be a Beacons throw from their own zone. When you talk about late game situations, the Beacons men's soccer team scored today with 329 left down at Dartmouth. As now we'll see a stoppage as the Beacons went all the way back to retrieve the ball in that instance. Um, but, yeah, I mean, these, these late-game situations, you think, oh, we're heading to overtime, and then all of a sudden a player makes a great individual effort, you give up a foul like this, and things get a little bit more difficult. Free kick coming up for the visiting Corsairs. It's going to be Lecano taking it. She took the last one and missed as she attempted to stretch the D. She'll do it again. This one a little shorter and unsuccessful. Stepor is able to knock it down, but nonetheless, Lecano gets there again. She sends it in. If they're on sides, they had 2 on 0, but luckily for the Beacons, Fugil was game. They were both on sides. A great job by Alyssa Fugil to come well off her line, and that's the kind of ball that's really dangerous at this point in the game. The second effort, Lecano did a nice job of retrieving it as Stebor didn't get much on that attempted clear. Here's Masionis knocking it down off the Stearns throw-in. She loses control to D'Ambrusio, who penetrates Stebor's defense and tries to send it to the far side, but Stebor smartly able to knock it down towards Peters. Stretch feed for O'Grady, but Lecano has the wheels, and she will be the last one to uh, get as close to it as she can, but it comes out of bounds off of Kara Peters, and a goal kick will ensue, and now the... Pedal has to start hitting the metal here with 3.40 to go for the Corsairs, trailing by a goal. Here's Lecano with the ball moving. She sends it to the near side. Silva's got to keep it inbound. She does with the head, but it comes right to Stebor, who did she contact that one? No, they say it. she did not, I don't think, and it'll be a throw-in for Levesque and the Beacons. Actually, it'll be Robinson. So a break for UMass Boston is a smart play by Stebor to not make contact. Here is Masionis looking to go right back to O'Grady, but it is Natasha Stebor settling it down from the 35-yard line. She turns around and tries to send it towards O'Grady, but didn't have the angle, and it comes out of bounds for a throw-in from Stearns. Silva over her head with that one, but unfortunately for number 19 in stripes, no one home as it comes out of bounds for another Robinson throw. Less than three minutes to go. Here's Carly's chance to... Send it forward as O'Grady's unable to get possession off the deflection of Silva. And right back to the bench it comes for another throw-in. Beacons continue to just milk the clock here late in half number two. Well, it's not just milking the clock. The longer you keep the ball close to the sideline, the longer that it keeps UMass Dartmouth pinned in. If they can start stretching the field, then they can create opportunities. You'll see Robinson try to bring it back to the near side, but miss hit on that one. He's trying to settle that one down is... Farious, and then she just shoves a beacon to the ground. That was Stebor. No call. I don't know how you don't have a call there. That is some um, abhorrent missed call right there as the beacon somehow don't get the benefit of the doubt. This one sent in off the noggin of D'Ambrusio, and then she collides with Masionis. Still no call, and now here to the far send side for Starkey Cox. She tries to go around. Slide tackle there from Bendick misses the mark. McMiniman on defense to the far end. This one sent in and wide of the net. And Seth Orensky, that was clearly, if not one, maybe two fouls. I, I think the first one, Seymour came in initially and provided the contact, and that's maybe why she didn't get it. The second one seems like an even more obvious call, but we've seen consistency, if nothing else, from Krista McCann. She's not going to give light fouls, and at this point, you just hope that nobody gets injured in the last going. Just both of these teams would really want the decision that they're aiming for. And 
the physicality has just gotten stronger and stronger as this game's going along. Less than 90 seconds to go. Minute 15 left. The Corsairs with possession. Stearns moving forward, trying to find some help as they will send it forward and rush. Headed back out of harm's way by Robinson. Taken by Peters, looking for assistance. No one there. Here's Farius. Farius to the far end. And eventually it'll be Starkey Cox taking it. She will motor it towards Erica Hammond. Hammond right back to Cox. And now with it now is Farius coming towards Lecano into the near end. Here's Farius. So the Beacons, 45 seconds left to protect as it's a good defensive play there on the play made by who else? Kate Levitt. She had the assist on the lone goal. Trying to settle it down was Farius. Instead it comes right back to Stearns. She Shoots this one up in the air like a mortar. Meanwhile, the Beacons see Starkey Cox unable to get possession, and with less than 30 seconds to go, just hammering it down was Hammond for the possession by the netminder, Fugil. And UMass Dartmouth can't get any long boots into the goal box right now because the wind's taking the ball right. It's taking the ball back into their faces, and this might do it after a nice clear from Kara Peters. Yeah, Peters got the job done, and unless there's rockets in the cleats of these Corsairs and Erica Hammond, the Beacons come out on top. They score one goal, and that has been the trend all season long, but it's all they needed this afternoon as they did it for the Wall and for Catherine Wall, winning one to nothing against their rivals from Dartmouth, Massachusetts, the Corsairs of UMass by the final score of one to nothing. So what a performance defensively for the Beacons, but also by Nicole McMiniman, who got the lone goal of this game early on on a corner kick from Kate Levitt, and the Beacons come out on top by the final score of one to nothing. With the victory, UMass Boston improves to 4-6-1 and one overall. They improve to 3-0 and oh in the Little East Conference. Meanwhile, the Corsairs will drop to 3-4-1 and 1-1-1 one, and one, one and one in the LEC. And with the win, the Beacons head off on that three-game road trip, Seth, with a little momentum at their backs, and that's huge. Yeah, a young team. They need to play well at home. Unfortunately, they only have three home games, but they're 2-0. and 3-0 and in conference with three shutouts, and that says a lot about this back four. It says a lot about Alyssa Fugil, who wasn't tested a lot. I honestly was more impressed with some of the plays where she came off of her line than any particular save, showing a lot of savvy for a freshman coming off a game in which she gave up six goals. This Beacons team is showing a lot of heart, um, which is something you need when you don't necessarily have the skill to compete with some of these teams, but... The Beacons now 2-0, and and we do it for wall games. 3-0 and in conference. You can't ask for much more at this point in the season. Record, you can throw that out the window. 4-6-1, and one, that doesn't matter. 3-0 and in Little East play, that's an achievement. Absolutely, and another achievement for the UMass Boston Beacons is what we saw today, perhaps a little bit of growth from some of the youth. Early on in this season, if you're looking at offense, you're relying almost solely on Jacqueline O'Grady. We thought with Kara Peters coming back, that might balancing act a little bit. But Julia Masionis today looked very good as an attacker. She did a great job involved in the action and almost got a goal late in the first half yet again. We also saw some great help from the supporting cast. What did you see today from the players around Jack and O'Grady that gives you hope that maybe the Beacons can find two or three other scorers here in the second half? Nicole McMiniman. It starts and ends right there. The senior who is looking for that first goal, she picked up her goal. It was a really beautiful back flick within the first five minutes. Then you've got Kate Levin, another assist. She's got two. She's a player who should have a lot more points this season and just has been a little bit unlucky. And then the Beacons back four continuing to be malleable, bending but not breaking. A nice job by that back four today, which encompassed Cassie and Alex Levesque, Sam Bendick, and Carly Robinson. It's been a different back four almost every other game at this point over the past couple of games with Elisa Brooks injured. And the Beacons do it again despite not having their full 11 that they expected this season. Yeah, and they'll get set to take on Wentworth Institute of Technology coming up on Tuesday. That's going to be a night game. We hope the weather can clear up a little bit, as that one will be an absolutely blistery evening from Wentworth. What do we know about Wentworth Tech that we should be expecting if somebody's going to be uh, you know, paying attention to what's going on? Well, in the past years, Crystal Layden has absolutely ravaged Wentworth. Unfortunately, Crystal Layden is graduated. Um, it, it's going to be another game where the Beacons in past years have really dominated opponent, but they have to find a way to beat a team without those senior leaders from a year ago. Um, it, it should be a game the Beacons can come away with a result, but the Beacons expected to go into Salem State this week and come away with a result. Maybe come away with the tie yesterday. So 
honestly, the big things in these games are not results. It's taking a step forward. Maybe getting that goal for Kerry Alexander, Kate Levitt, getting those players some confidence going into a very difficult game next week against Eastern Connecticut State. Beacons have played three teams they were projected to finish ahead of in conference play. Those are the games you're supposed to win. Now they play the teams that they're, they were projected to finish behind. If you can steal a victory or two there, you're looking at a first round bye. Definitely a home game um, in the quarterfinals. Absolutely. The Beacons have four wins this season, all via the shutout. We'll see if that trend continues the rest of the way as they move forward here in 2015. So UMass Boston comes out on top by the final score of one to nothing as Nicole McMinimins' first goal of the season, less than 10 minutes into the affair, is the only one on the scoreboard as the Beacons come out on top and improve to 3-0 and in the Little East Conference. We have team stats for you throughout this second half and through the final team stats of the game as the Beacons come out on top by the final score of one to nothing. We'll also wrap things up and put a bow on it as the Beacons continue their fight for a Little East Conference regular season championship. They won't be back here for two weeks when they take on WestCon on the 17th of October, a 3 p.m. match right here on the Beacons Broadcasting Network, but that should be an exciting one that you'll be able to see and hear on your screen. And, of course, they have plenty of matchups against LEC foes such as EastCon, WestCon, Keene State, and Plymouth State still to go here in 2015-16. So the UMass Boston Beacons triumph over the odds to come out and top one to nothing. They send the Corsairs of Dartmouth to 1-1-1 one, one, and one overall, or rather 1-1-1 one, one, and one in the conference and 3-4-1 and one overall. And the Beacons move into a tie for first place in the conference at 3-0 and oh with the Eastern Connecticut State University team as they are right on top of where they want to be. So UMass Boston wins it one to nothing here on week. Do it for the wall day as they continue to play behind the spirit of the late Catherine Wall. For everyone involved and the players on the field and Seth Orensky who just left the booth, I'm John Scudris. Thank you for joining us yet again on the Beacons Broadcasting Network. The Beacons win one to nothing. Improved to three and zero in the Little East Conference. Until next time, good night, good luck, and good soccer. I'm John Scudris signing off on the Beacons Broadcasting Network.